Hello, uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, this is Java Language Future, Spring 2021 edition. My name is Gavin Beerman. I work at Oracle. I'm part of the Java platform group. And more specifically, I'm a member of the design team helping to design the Java programming language. Before I start, I need to draw your attention to this safe harbor slide. This is very important for a talk like mine, where that is forwards looking by nature. Uh, I want to show you the cutting edge of where we are with the Java language. So please don't rely on anything you hear today for your business. But before I get on to the technical details, I do have to address the elephant in the room, which is, does Java actually have a future? After all, it's an old language, uh, as programming languages go. And there are lots of cool, uh, exciting younger languages that people are using. Uh, Java has been declared many times, declared dead many times, um, but Java is still the world's most popular programming platform. So we're not going anywhere soon, um, but we're not sitting still. Uh, how, how do we plan to keep Java uh, vibrant? Well, firstly, um, we need to stay relevant to the problems people are using Java to solve. There are lots of Java developers inside Oracle, but we have lots of colleagues outside Oracle too. And we are very aware of the sorts of things that people are using Java for. Looking at these gives us clues and directions for where we need to take the language. Perhaps less obviously, we need to keep Java relevant to the hardware platforms that people are running Java on. This uh, is always changing. And this obviously has an impact on us, both from our compilers and libraries, but also the language as well. We need to keep meeting ever rising developer expectations. I think this comes both because developers are increasingly well trained, um, but they're also exposed to many languages and systems. Um, they come to Java expecting to find features and techniques that they've learned from other languages. So this keeps on our toes. And finally, we uh, have to keep the promises that we made to our users. And this is very important to us. And I think distinguishes Java from uh, many other languages, in particular our promises around compatibility. Finally, we are keeping Java vibrant by adopting a rapid development methodology. Hopefully you have all heard this, um, but a couple of years ago, we moved to a six monthly release cycle of, re of few feature releases of Java. Uh, now, another th feature that we brought to our methodology is previewing language features. Now, a preview feature is a complete feature. Uh, so it comes with a full compiler implementation a full specification, tests, and so on. But the idea is that you need to opt in to use a preview feature. So you can't rely on a preview feature by mistake. You have to use a flag both on the compiler and on the virtual machine. We preview a feature, and then when we come to the next release of Java, we make a decision. Are we going to finalize the feature? Are we going to make it a permanent feature of the language? Are we going to preview the feature again, um, perhaps amending the design based on feedback from our users, or are we going to not go ahead with the feature at all? Uh, this is a very nice new methodology because we get back on our design. Uh, in fact, all of the features that we've released as preview features, we have amended the design and re-previewed based on feedback from our community. So this is a great way for you to help uh, help us design the Java language. Java 16 has just been released. Um, uh, hopefully you've had a chance to look at it. Uh, from the language perspective, there are three new features uh, in the language. Records, pattern matching, for instance, of and sealed classes. Now for the rest of this talk, I'm going to split into two parts. The first part, um, I will summarize these three features. And in the second part, which I want to get to as quickly as I can, I want 
talk to you about some of the features we're hoping to bring to you in future releases of Java. Starting with, uh, so let's start with Java 16. In my uh, last Oracle Developer Live talk, I spent most of my time talking about record classes. So in this talk, I'm gonna focus on the uh, other two features. Let me start by looking at the feature that we're previewing for a second time, and that's sealed classes. Sealed classes address a long time oversight in the Java language, where if you want a class to be widely accessible, then it also has to be widely extensible. Consider this simple example of a mathematical expression expra. Uh, it needs to be public because we need it to be widely accessed, but at the same time, we want it to be narrowly implemented, say by classes only in the same package. But of course, if expra is widely accessible, then it's also widely extensible. You can stop your own implementations from being extended by making them final, but we can't stop new implementations like divide here in red from being declared in faraway packages. And if an instance of divide were to make its way back to code that expected only the first three implementations of expra, then bad things could happen. But in Java 16, you can seal the interface expra, which means that it is widely accessible, but no longer widely extensible. A sealed class or interface spells out all the classes that are permitted to extend it or implement it. Here, expra is declaring that only the classes constant add and multiply can implement it. If we attempt to define a class divide that implement this interface, this will result in a compile time error. Moreover, at runtime, the VM would refuse to load a class file that was not a permitted subclass. There's no way for us to define an unpermitted subtype. In my example so far, all the permitted subclasses were final, but this is not a requirement. A permitted subclass can be sealed itself with its own permitted subclasses. Here, for example, the class constant is sealed itself and permits a small subset of subclasses 0, 1, and pi. A permitted subclass can even declare itself as non-sealed in order to have its part of the hierarchy revert to being open to extension by unknown subclasses. For example, here, the class add could unseal itself in order to allow some off-screen set of subclasses that optimize, say, for adding very large and very small numbers. Note that subclasses are not dangerous to code that expected only the three permitted implementations of extra because they are all subtypes. As I mentioned earlier, I went into quite a bit of detail into the records feature in my last developer live talk. So you can check that out on YouTube or on the Oracle site. There's also a wonderful talk coming up later in the conference by my colleagues Chris Hegarty and Julia Boas with the title, When Records Met Serialization. I'm lucky enough to have seen an early version of this talk. So I know it gives a very detailed and broad analysis of record classes and also how they have a nice story with respect to serialization. So I'm going to be brief here um, describing record classes, but as some of the features that I want to talk about build on record classes, I need to give you a quick revision today. What is a record class? Well, a record class is a class that acts as a transparent aggregate for immutable data. Now that's quite a, quite a mouthful, so let me unpack that sentence for you. Uh, it's transparent, which means that a record class makes all of its data available to its clients. 
It's an aggregate. And by this, I mean that it, the record class is just a simple carrier. It's really just a collection of data values. Perhaps we validate or normalize those values, but otherwise it is just the values itself. Moreover, it is immutable. Once you have um, assigned the values, uh, you can't change them. So very much a record class is about the data, the whole data, nothing about but the data. If you have used another programming language, the best way to think of a record is that it's a nominal tuple. So a tuple is a data type in other programming languages, which just serves as of collecting up values into a single data type. Um, but in Java, all types have names. So it's like a named uh, tuple type. Now, these classes are very simple, so, but unfortunately in Java 15, they're actually quite tricky to write. There's a lot of boilerplate, but they ought to be simple to declare and use as they are by their nature quite simple. And since JDK 16, they now are. Let me show you how to declare a record class. This is a complete declaration of the record class. It uh, has the name point and the record class point has two components, two integer components, X and Y. And this is it. This is all you need to declare to declare record class point. Let's see how we use such uh, classes, record classes. I'm going to move this declaration to the top of it and let's see how we use it. We create instances of the record class using a new expression as we expect. It's a class after all. The constructor expects two integers because according to the declaration, all points consist of two integer values. So there are no, automatically there are no single integer constructors or constructors that take uh, no values. The constructor argument list matches the header, the thing between round braces in the record class declaration. Record classes provide automatically an accessor met for every record component. Our record class here has two components, X and Y, so we have two accessor methods, X and Y, that return you the values of the components. Remember that uh, the components are immutable. So if you attempt to mutate them, this will result in a compile time error. Record classes come automatically with the most important methods we need to use them in our code. First of all, they come with an equals method that as you would expect, doesn't compare two values by object identity, but compares them by the component values. After all, a record class is just about the data. Secondly, they come with a hash code method, which computes a hash code based on the component values. This means that instant, uh, record values can be stored in collections that need to compute a hash value. Thirdly, record classes come automatically with a two-string method, so you can print a record value to the screen, for example. Now, there's a lot more to record classes. You can define your own versions of these methods. There are some very fancy uh, forms of constructors and so on, but you don't need to know about these for the purposes of this talk. Here's a typical use of a record class. Here I have a method which is taking a list of merchants and we're going to um, calculate sales for each merchant and return them in an ordered list. We do this in the typical way by building a stream, um, by converting the list to a stream, and then we do classic stream processing on, on that stream. Now, partway through the stream processing, we need to build a stream containing pairs of merchants and their sales. Now this is perfect for defining as a record class because this is just a simple value 
aggregating two components, a merchant and a sales. So here in the method, I define a local record class called merchant sales, and I build instances of this class in the middle of my stream processing code. Okay, let me turn to the third feature uh, released in Java 16, which is pattern matching for instance of. So Java excels at modeling data and constructing or building instances of data types, but it's less good at providing compact and powerful ways of deconstructing the data. Pattern matching was an idea originating from functional programming languages, gives a very convenient way of deconstructing values. We've all written code like this before, where we have some object obj that we need to test and extract a value out of. Here we're testing to see if it's a string, and if it's a string, then we would like to use the string value in the body of the then block. Unfortunately, in Java 15, we, it, this is a little bit cumbersome, not least of which because we have to write the types three times. We use instance of to test, we define a local variable uh, S of type string, and we have to cast obj to the type string, even though in the body of the then block, we know it must be a string. Now this is irritating boilerplate that we would like to remove. And pattern matching, in fact, fuses the declaration of local variables, testing, conditional extraction, and initialization of local variables. So let's see this in action. What we have done is extended the instance of uh, operator. So it can now take on the right-hand side, a pattern. What we see here in red is a type pattern. What does this mean? Well, what this means is that the uh, operand on the left, obj, is compared with the pattern. This comparison is a test to see if the value is a type string. If it is, then we'd say that matching succeeds, and so instance of here would return true. And more importantly, the local variable s is initialized to the string value. You no longer need to write the cast or the declaration. The declaration is actually in the pattern itself. So hopefully many of the world's casts will disappear at this point. So now this brings me on to my second part of the talk, which is looking ahead to the future of Java. So I'm now looking at features that will appear in some version of the JDK, hopefully for 17, but perhaps a little further away. We've recently released a draft JEP called Record Patterns and Array Patterns. So I'd like to talk a little about, bit about this feature today. Um, time is short, so I'm just going to talk about the record patterns. Imagine we have an interface shape and a record class circle that consists of a point and a radius, and a point is also a record class con consisting of two integers. Uh, now, I want to take some shape value and I want to see if it's a circle and if it is, I would like to extract the center and the radius. So this is how I'd write it today in Java 15. I would write an instance of with my local variable and my cast. Now I've just showed that in Java 16, I can replace that first line and use a type pattern in the instance of uh, expression. Now this is great and the code is looking better, but there's something a little cumbersome going on here. The type pattern gives a name to the circle, but I really need it other than using it to take apart the um, circle uh, record value. Now remember a record class is a simple aggregate of data, right? I create it with, with two integer values. What I'm doing in the then block here is kind of the opposite. Given this record value, I want to actually disaggregate it into the component values and use those in the rest block. 
Uh, I know this always makes sense because it's a record and records always have the component values. So let's extend the language of patterns to express this disaggregation. What I'm going to do is not use a type pattern, but a new sort of pattern called a record pattern. And as I said, the record pattern serves to disaggregate the value, to pull it apart into the values, which are then and I then initialize the center and radius variables in the pattern to those component values. So in other words, what this pattern means is, are you a circle? If you are, then initialize the local variable center to the center component and the local variable radius to the radius component. Now, as we're familiar in, in modern Java, we expect to be able to drop the types of any local variable durations. And indeed, I would allow this, we are allowed to do this in a record pattern too. So here I have dropped the types of center and radius and just write far. The compiler can infer the types of these uh, local variables from the declaration of the circle class. Let's carry on with this example. Imagine that what I do with the center is extract the X and Y components, because remember that the center is of type point and point is a record class. So what I want to do with center is actually just disaggregate it into the two components. But hang on, that sounds almost identical to what I said before to motivate using a record pattern in the first place. In other words, what I want to do is replace this um, variable declaration here with another record pattern. What I would like to do is nest another record pattern, the pattern point far x far y, inside the record pattern uh, concerning a circle record. Now there's a lot going on here and just like the Sherlock Holmes story about the dog that didn't bark, the point of this is really what you don't have to write as much as what you do. Let's imagine writing this code fragment in Java 15 without any patterns. It would look like this. We would take the shape, we compare it to a circle with an instance of test, we cast, we then extract the center, but oh, remember, uh, point record classes are classes, so that value could be null. So we need to check for null, otherwise we might throw a null pointer exception. So we need to do something, return from the method or throw an exception perhaps. And that at this point, now we can extract the components. So already you can see that allowing nested record patterns allows for much more compact code. And this nesting works arbitrarily deep. It just reflects the type declarations. Imagine that our circle uh, consists of a colored point and a radius, where a colored point is itself a record containing a point and a color, and a point itself is a record type, a record class containing two ints. So we can write a record pattern of depth three to match our hierarchy of depth three. So here we have a point record pattern contained in a colored point record pattern contained in a circle point, a circle pattern. And you can imagine how yucky the non-pattern code would look here. Let me wrap up by just considering another jet that uh, we have drafted recently. And this is pattern matching for switch. Up to this point, we've used instance of to do pattern matching, but we have another candidate and that's switch. Remember, uh, comes in both statement and expression forms. The basic idea here is to extend the case labels in a switch block from having constants, which is what they have today, to having patterns. So here in this pattern switch, the case label, the first case label is the pattern and it's a type pattern circle C. So the idea here, the semantics of the pattern switch is that it takes the shape 
and it pattern matches the shape against the case labels to see which one matches and then ex, uh, executes the appropriate rule. Now this is similar to a type switch, which is an often requested feature for Java, but it's not just types in the labels, it's patterns. And indeed, it could be any of the fancy patterns that I've shown you just earlier. So we could imagine having a record pattern in a label or indeed a nested record pattern in the label too. And this is an example of why this feature is more powerful than a top switch. Okay, so that takes me to the end of the talk. I hope I've shown to you that uh, the Java language uh, is evolving fast. We're delivering new features fast. In uh, JDK 16, we are shipping records and pattern matching for instance of as final features. And we're also previewing for a second time sealed classes. And in future versions of the JDK, we hope to ship record patterns, which support nesting, uh, pattern matching for switch, and also array patterns, which I didn't have time to show you. Uh, so I encourage you to please uh, take a look at these draft JEPs. You can search for them and find them. And there will be prototype versions of the compiler uh, soon. So try it out and let us know what you think. And we look forward to your feedback. So at this point, I shall move to questions and answers. So hopefully there are some questions coming up. Excellent, right. So I see we've got some uh, questions here. So the first question is, is there a way to give a default name for a pattern variable? Ah, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, so at the moment, uh, we don't allow, what I think you mean is, is there a way to specify, for example, a type pattern, uh, say string, but not actually give a name to the pattern variable because you don't need it? So that's something we're considering. The prime candidate for that would be probably an underscore character to represent I don't care about the name. Um, so at the moment, that's a, a possibility. Um, so we'd like your feedback to see if that's a feature we need to add to, to pattern matching. Okay, let's see, right. What about pattern matching on classes that are not record classes? Excellent question. So that's uh, trickier. Um, so the nice thing about record classes is that um, record classes are special sorts of classes. They're very restricted, right? So in particular, we're guaranteed to have component values and there can be no hidden fields, no fields inherited from, from other records and so on. So we know exactly what is contained in a record value. It's just the data and nothing but the data. So that enables us to um, automatically match against a record value very easily. Now with general classes, that of course is not true. Um, so classes might have no public fields. They uh, might want to uh, generate field members or values from other values, for example. Um, so it's not so obvious how to automatically allow pattern matching on uh, general classes. However, uh, in a series of white papers that um, Brian Goetz and I have written, we give an outline of how we might provide a mechanism for general classes to declare in their body somewhere, in their declaration, how they can be pattern matched against. So they would declare some sort of pattern and they would give code, which obviously has to be provided by the user, um, that details how the values are calculated. So at the moment, that's a little way out. We, we don't have a final design for that, but that's something that's on our roadmap. Okay, let's see. 
<laughs> so yes. So uh, the, the question is, uh, is non-sealed really a keyword? So I, I flashed that by very fast, deliberately. Um, so yes, it uh, turns out that we have given ourselves a little bit more freedom in our space of keywords and contextual keywords and so on to allow hyphenated keywords. Um, and that's particularly useful for um, modifiers where we often provide a modifier, but there isn't a particularly good English word for uh, setting the negation of the modifier and allowing ourselves a hyphen in a keyword will give us a whole new space of uh, keywords and in particular being able to define non non not hyphen keywords so um, non sealed is the first proposal that uses that so yes it, it really is a, a new um, sort of keyword okay so let's see if there's another question ah record patterns don't seem to give a name for the record why not Yes, very good. So um, the record patterns currently, all they do is this degradation. So they pull values apart, they decompose the value. Um, but they don't name the entire value themselves. So why not? Well, we could add that. Um, but uh, the experience of languages that offer these sorts of patterns already is that typically one either uses a type pattern, so you're testing and you want to give a name to the value, or you deconstruct. You don't often need to do both. And requiring names everywhere as the default will probably lead to us having to support some underscore notation, like I mentioned as an answer to the first question. And if we have record patterns taking this as taking names for the record as a default, we're gonna have underscores all over the place. Um, so in other languages, they in fact uh, introduce another pattern form for naming a deconstruction pattern. So this is commonly called an as pattern. So we're currently looking at what we can do here and, and whether we need to go as far as providing a new pattern or whether we can be clever with the parser. So at the moment, we're not offering that. It's on our to-do list. Um, so again, we'd like people to try it out and tell us how important that feature is. Okay, hopefully we've got time for another question. Excellent. Okay, good. So this is a question which asks, can you briefly say what array patterns look like? So uh, that's great because I had a slide prepared for that. So let me go back to this slide. Um, so uh, here I have a type pattern, which I'm using to test some object O to see if it's a string array. So uh, type patterns support any type, including um, uh, array types. So this is perfectly valid in Java 16. You can test whether the array is a string array using a pattern. And now we want to do something else. So given that it's a string array, we also would like to test whether the um, string array has at least two elements, which we do using the uh, length. And then we would like to extract those two elements from the array and say print out there they print them out to the screen uh, appended to each other now this um, testing of a um, value to see if it's of a type but wanting to decompose the value feels very similar to record patterns right where we had a record and what we wanted to do was disaggregate it here we have an array and what we'd like to do is both test that it's a string array but then use some of the um, components of the array. So uh, analogous to uh, the record patterns we plan to support 
um, an array pattern. So here's an example of an array pattern. So this pattern uh, in red here asks that um, the value is a string array, and then it names the array components. And you can use those uh, variables, they're local variables, you can use them in the then block. So this one asks whether the first, so it names the first component S1, uh, names the second component S2, and we introduce this notation of three dots here to say that this is an array with at least two elements. So any array that, any string array that has two at least two strings in it uh, will match this pattern. And then you can use the S1 and S2 in the body. If we drop the three dots, which is a pattern that we also support, then this pattern is asking that it's an array with exactly two string components. So, uh, and it, array patterns, since arrays in, in Java can be uh, multi-dimensional, so an array component can be another array, and we allow nesting of array patterns in a similar way to how we support nesting of record patterns. So you get a very uh, succinct pattern matching over multi-dimensional arrays using these array patterns. So we hope in particular in, in sort of machine learning applications where people are dealing with array arrays quite a lot, that this form of pattern matching will be especially helpful. Okay, so I think that uh, brings me to the end of, of my talk.